my report is on major theories of training, learning practice and development. And I hope that this one is clearer and better than the last time. All right. So let's have first this activation activity and I named this one as schema testing. The direction is to identify the definitions of the following statements based on their corresponding terms below. And you can use your module in answering this one. So write only the letter of your choice if the answers are going to be based on the pink rows. So A for theory, B for law, C for belief, D for hypothesis, E for fact. The first question, a basic statement established by experimental observation, these are true under specific conditions, but some may be false when retested with better instruments. So what is your answer? And the answer for this is letter E, fact. Number two, a logical relationship between two or more things that is based on a rigorous study on a variety of facts and hypothesis. It is often a mathematical statement of how two or more quantities relate to each other. The correct answer is the B, law. Number three, it is a tentative statement such as if A happens, then B must happen. That can be tested by the direct experimental observation. So number three, the correct answer is letter J, hypothesis. And number four is my topic for today. It is a set of interrelated constructs, concepts, definitions, and propositions that present a systematic view of phenomena by specifying relations among variables with the purpose of explaining and predicting the phenomena. So the answer is the A, theory, and that will be the topic for today, and that's the definition. And number five, a statement that is not scientifically probable, similar to other research concepts, but can still be held to be true. So the correct answer for number five is the one and only belief. All right. So as a unit overview, training and development refer to the obtaining or transferring the knowledge, skills, and abilities of the case, a process needed to carry out a specific activity or functions. So the benefits of training and develop development both for organization and individual are strategic in nature and is much wider. Training is also defined as a planned process to modify attitude, knowledge, skill, or behavior through learning experience to achieve effective performance in an activity or range of activities. Its purpose in the work situation, of course, is to develop the abilities of the individuals and to satisfy the current and future needs of the organization. So, training and development will also need continuous improvement and so theories can help us understand real world by creating those relationships between the different aspects from the theory's perspective. The theory is a fundamental collection of statements which has been subjected to regular testing on how the world functions. There are many innovative, sophisticated and influential theoretical frameworks in the field of training that have been developed and thus meaningful comprehensive and focused theories allow for empirical studies to be tested in the field of training and to improve the job performance in different organizations. So, here are the first, here is the first topic, the four major theories of training and development and we are going to discuss under this first topic, the four theories, the reinforcement theory, the theory of learning types, the experiential learning theory, and the social learning theory. So the first one is the reinforcement theory. The reinforcement theory was initiated by Boris Friedrich Skinner, which referred to as behaviorism or operant conditioning, and it is still universally taught in psychology today and even in education. 
Ms. Kana, well-known advocate of behavioral psychologist, made an important contribution to the understanding of the learning process and produced the theory of operant conditioning or what we know as the enforcement theory. The operant conditioning theory is based upon the idea that learning is a function of change, change in overt behavior. Um, operant conditioning refers to a systematic program of rewards and punishments to influence behavior or bring about desired behavior. behavior. So Skinner and Watson, John Watson, are actually two of the most uh, prominent advocates of behaviorism theory or specifically the reinforcement theory. And there are other theories under behaviorism apart from reinforcement theory. We also have Ivan Pavlov's classical conditioning in which John Watson had also studied. And John Watson is also one of the advocates or the proponents of the, brain, of the behaviorism theory. So the reinforcement theory is used to increase the probability that behavior will occur in the future or as punishment aims to decrease that probability. McKenna suggested that factors like attention, price, approval, success, and money are major reinforcers for the humans. You would love to work for eight hours just because you received salary and that's part of reinforcement. So in every organization, there's a need for attention, for prices, for approval, for success, and even for money so that the employees or the individuals themselves will continue working for the organization and continue their performance as expected of, of each individual. So determining why an individual behaves the way he does or the way one does can also no role for individual intentions or goals in it. So that's the sad point about this theory. However, Skinner believes that external behavior and its environment are, are of primary importance. The reinforcement theory has actually four most important approaches, so which are positive reinforcement, the negative reinforcement, the extinction, and then the punishment, which we will discuss on the fourth topic of my report. So, Ratan et al. found Skinner who believed that reinforcement operates either positively or negatively. And positive reinforcement is an event that strengthens an operant response if it is experienced after that response occurs. So, while negative reinforcement and punishment can lead to avoid an unpleasant situation, so for example, if there's absenteeism, the, the tendency is for an organization to employ punishment and that means absenteeism would mean deduction of salary per minute. So that is a form of punishment which is anchored in the reinforcement theory of uh, Skinner. And then of course, if, if the employer, if the employee or the trainee has produced a positive project or a positive behavior or a something that would contribute to the success of the organization then the tendency is for the leader of, of the organization to to consider or provide for a positive reinforcement in forms of rewards incentives and as an example if you do research for the organization and we get to publish those researches then the tendency is for uh, positive reinforcement that means you'll be rewarded for that published research so next is the theory of learning learning types so robert gagne was the one who proposed this one gagne and he was an educational psychologist who pioneered the science of instruction named as nine events of instruction. So if you notice from the orange diagram or organizer, there are nine levels. And the other term for this is the conditions of learning in which he identified the mental conditions that are necessary for effective learning. So this theory stipulates that there are different levels for learning 
And the significance of these classifications is that each different type would require a different type of instruction. So Gagne suggested that learning tasks for intellectual skills can be organized in a hierarchy according to complexity, stimulus recognition, the response generation, the procedure following use of terminology, discriminations, concept formation, rule application, and of course even problem solving. So this this nine levels each of that it has a corresponding test analysis so for each of that you need to provide a test and the importance of the hawaii case to identify prerequisites that should be achieved to import learning at each level the prerequisites are identified by doing a test analysis of a learning or training test Therefore, the theory outlines nine instructional events and corresponding cognitive processes, and these events should satisfy or provide the necessary conditions for learning and can serve as the basis for designing instruction and selecting appropriate media. At times, this is actually called the Gagne and Briggs uh, instructional design. So there's nine levels of instruction. This is one of those famous there's one of those famous instructional designs which an educational extensionist or if even the educators can use or the trainers can use for training or for as an intervention or blank writing strategies. So these nine levels, this uh, theory of Gagne can be used for creating the interventions, the strategies and the components that will make up the training. So this one is actually famous and even in creating a lesson uh, lesson plans for the teachers this nine events are actually applied next is the experiential learning theory so from the film itself experience the employee can learn effectively if the employee can be able to apply what he is learning through his experience. The experiential learning is a cyclical process that capitalizes on the participants' experiences for acquisition of knowledge. This process involves setting goals, thinking, planning, experimentation, reflection, observation, and review. By engaging in these activities, learners construct meaning or the trainers themselves, they construct meaning to unique to themselves, incorporating the cognitive, emotional, and the physical aspects of learning. Experiential learning theory can actually provide a holistic model of the learning process and a multilinear model of adult development, according to Baker, Jensen, and Kolb. In other words, this is an inclusive model of adult learning that intends to explain the complexities of indifferences between adult learners within a single framework. So the focus of this theory is experience, which this experience can serve as the main driving force in learning as knowledge is constructed through the transformative reflection based on one's experience. But I would beg to disagree with that because experiential learning theory is actually also useful for young learners as they can learn better when they are exposed to it or when they get to have self-discovery and, ex and experience how to do a particular thing, for example, and doing a project uh, charter. You can learn effectively if you really l experience writing a project charter or you can learn research better if you have done research and experienced the process of research rather than merely reading it in books. So, um, the, lear the learning model outlined by the experiential learning theory contains two distinct modes of gaining experience that are related to each other on a continuum. We have the concrete experience of the apprehension and on the abstract conceptualization or the comprehension. In addition, there are also two distinct modes of transform transforming the experience so that learning is achieved. The reflection observation and the active experimentation, as you can see in the four boxes. 
When these four modes are viewed together, they constitute a four-stage learning cycle that learners would need to go through during the experiential learning process. So all of this in the boxes actually take place for effective learning to happen according to this theory. So learners begin with a concrete experience, which then lets them to observe and reflect on their experience. After this period of reflective observation, the learners then piece their thoughts together to create abstract concepts about what occurred, which will serve as guides for future actions. With these guides in place, therefore, the learners can actively test what they have constructed that will lead to new experiences for them to build and then renew, renewing of this similar cycle for actual learning to take place. And, and if a trainee or an employee or a learner is more comfortable perceiving new information in a concrete manner and actively experimenting during the processing of the experience, the learner then must also undergo some abstract conceptualization and reflective observation in order to complete the cycle and lead to effective learning. Thus, a learner who experiments with models and manipulates them in the process of learning must also be able to conceptualize and form observations based on what or she or she he or she experiences. And this must occur even if the learners do not consider them str themselves strong in these areas. So this is at the heart of the ELT model and Cobb's view, view of the adult learner. And somehow this experiential, experiential learning theory is actually adaptable to extend, um, ex extension educators because uh, we know that we can learn better as to the setting of a particular community once we go to that community. So once we experience for ourselves what the needs are, how we should be able to help them. So this experiential learning theory can really contribute to an effective kind of learning. Next is the study or the theory of Bandura. The social learning theory is uh, was propounded by Albert Bandura and it underscores the indis indispensability of soil being in modeling people's behaviors, attitudes, and emotional reactions. It is a theory that concentrates on learning by way of observation and modeling. That's the key term for the social learning theory, observation, modeling. The theory originally evolved from behaviorism, and it was the source from which social learning theory emanated. So today, it has involved some ideas of the cognitivist, and consequently as well, it is given another name, which is social, co social cognitive learning. So this social learning theory also focuses and the environmental and cognitive factors that interact in order to impact human learning and behavior. It opines that individuals can learn from one another, including such concepts as observational learning, imitation, and modeling. So for example, you need to have uh, a leader whom you look up to in an organization for you to do well in your workplace, or for an employee to do well in the workplace, a, a leader who is um, and who can be an inspiration and other than that you also need to imitate his wise if if you are if if you respect that leader you can imitate the some, at times the way he talks uh, the way that the leader would would do his um, activities and his work and so what you do in order to do that would be observational learning so these three concepts, observational learning, imitation, and modeling, are actually inherent to the social learning theory of Bandura. In a simple term, you learn cooking because you've seen, you watch your mother or you observe your mother cook food for you. So in the same way, in an organization, you know what a project charter is because you've been exposed uh, to a particular model who demonstrated about the project charter.
Now, the next topic would be on the few rays of human resource development. So, this few rays we have three the psychological theory, the economic theory, and then the systems theory. So the human resource development is actually also new to my vocabulary. I mean, the definitions about it, but let's try to uncover how are these theories, three theories make up the human resource development. So H are they, for the definition, Human resource development is a process of developing and or unleashing human expertise through organization development and personal training and development for the purpose of improving performance. The domains of performance include the organization, work process, and group or individual levels. This one is according to Swanson. Organization development is the process of systematically implementing organizational change for the purpose of improving performance. The training and development is the process of systematically developing expertise in individuals for the purpose of improving uh, performance. And the three critical application areas of the human resource development would include the human resource management, the career development, and then the quality improvement. This is, of course, according to Swanson. Um, according to Compicite, human resource development, in simple terms, this would be the simple definition of HRD. HRD is a process covering training of new employees, their adaptation, professional development, reskilling them, the career development, and reserve formation. Of course, uh, you would do this in order to improve and develop personal and teamwork performance, having combined organizational and personal employees' objectives and needs, and allowing the employees continually develop in this way of achieving the best possible results of the organization. So, if you've seen the chair, the pillar of the chair would be the economic, the system, and the psychological. And that makes up the H or the theory. So the discipline of H or D relies on three core theories in order to understand, explain, and carry out its process and roles. They can include the psychological, the economic, and then the systems theory. It's like it's like saying that these three pillars are the main theories of human resource development, but each of these three sprang different sub theories so let's proceed to the psychological theory the psychological theory captures the core human aspects of developing human resources as well as the social technical interplay of the humans and systems we all know that in an organization there is the psychological test that is being done prior to entering in an organization because that is normal. An organization needs to consider the social emotional experience as well as the psychological experiences of the employees. So the psychology principles for practice revolve around the mental processes of humans and the determinants of human behavior. So among scholars and practitioners of psychology, the schisms and gimmicks reported under the psychology banner abound with little integration. However, as the three psychology sub-theories are interpreted in terms of the theory and practice relevant to human resource development, the discipline and profession will mature. So, again, the psychological principles appear to be elementary but are regularly ignored in practice. So, under the psychological theory, there are sub-theories that sprang. And, I w for example, for this for this. Um, topic I can only give three the result psychology I don't I don't know if you heard of it uh, it's familiar for us it's actually we actually use this one in education um, the result psychology states that the HRD or the human resource develop development must clarify the goals of individual contributors what progress owners and what organizational leaders Second one is behavioral psychology. The HRD 
must develop the behaviors of all the employees or even the leaders, uh, all the contributors, the work process owners, and the organization leaders. For the cognitive theory under the psychological theory is the cognitive psychology or the purposive behaviorism. Actually, Tolman, uh, Tolman is another theorist. He proposed that there is a purpose in whatever we do in life, that there's a purpose in uh, in our actions. So according to cognitive psychology, HRD, HRD must harmonize the goals and behaviors among individual contributors, work process owners, and organization leaders. For the economic theory, the economic theory captures the core issues of the efficient and effective utilization of resources to meet productive goals in a highly competitive environment. So the economic principles for practice revolve around how to manage the scarce resources and the production of wealth. So most people who talk about performance can mentally convert units of performance performance into monetary units. The HRD itself has costs and benefits that need to be understood and are not always favorable. Again, the principles for practice sound elementary, yet it must be addressed. So there are subsets or sub-theories under the economic theory. So the first one is the scarce resources theory. The HRD, it states that the HRD must justify its own use of the scarce resources. Next is the sustainable resource theory. The HRD must add value to creating sustainable long-term economic performance. For example, if you want to have a project right now amid this pandemic, then you would be able, you should be able to ensure that you have enough budget that can sustain the project in order to reach the free post-pandemic society. So that if if that's your problem, you can use the sustainable resource theory. And then, of course, the human capital theory. It states that HRD must add short-term and long-term value from investments in the development of knowledge and expertise in individuals or groups. So right now, since we are under the pandemic, there's actually a need for to address those economic problems that is happening worldwide or economic problems that are happening worldwide and somehow looking into the economic theory it might be able to address some of those problems next is the systems theory so the systems theory captures the complex and dynamic interactions of environments, organizations, work process, and group or individual variables operating at any point in time and over time. So the system theory principles for practice are organic. The system elements, their arrangements, the interdependencies, the complex nature of the phenomenon under study must be faced. So the system theory principles for practice require serious thinking and sound theory building research and the utilization of new tools for sound practice. A full pursuit of the following simple principles for practice will reshape the HRD purpose and to toolbox. So there are three sub theories under the systems theory. The systems theory actually makes up the relationships in the organization, the how the organization works, the vision and the mission. So it for those concerns the complexity of how the the um, organization continues are all part of the systems theory as to the upworking of an organization. So the three examples for the sub theories, the first one would include the general general system theory. It highlights that HRD must understand how it and all the subsystems connect and disconnect from the host organization. The chaos theory, HRD must help its host organization retain its purpose and effectiveness given the chaos it faces. So 
during this pandemic how all the how can your project be able to to overcome those kayas that might be experienced due to the pandemic the problems and what all possible opportunities so those that's an example of how we can use this kayas theory and then the futures theory uh it states that hrd must help its host organization shape alternative future so with using this futures theory we would want a project that can be able to help us develop a free post-pandemic society so we will look forward to that and look into the study this futures theory now why are the studying these theories of human resource development important sound hrd theory results in a powerful and practical explanation principles and models for the professionals to carry out their work in organizations so the problem facing almost every organization and those that work with them is a meeting the constant demand for high performance we know how the global market can be globally com can be highly competitive for the employees as well as for other organizations so these theories are actually um, pillars that would pillars that would help the organizations to meet the demands in the current based on the current need so in those organizations are human-made entities and that they can require human expertise to perform grow and adapt so these demands include everything from assuring sustainable financial growth of the organization to satisfying the next customer standing in the front row without a theoretically sound model of human resource development within an organizational system and improvement context the practitioner is left with the task of starting from scratch to build the strategies for each and every hrd challenge they face or worse yet they simply charge ahead in a trial and error mode just like our educational system today that is simply an experimental period for us as we transition to the online online learning environment so in that case those theories theories can naturally help us deal with the chaos that is happening worldwide and those theories can help us build strategies in whatever challenges that we face in terms of human resource development <clears throat> my third topic will be on the theoretical framework on training and development so you can actually use um, those past theories that I've discussed or some of the theories that I would still discuss. So first, let us define what a theoretical framework is. So Swanson explicitly asserts that the theoretical framework is the structure that can hold or support a theory of a research study. A theoretical framework comprises the theories expressed by expert, experts in the field into which you plan to research, which you draw upon to provide a theoretical coat hanger for your data analysis and interpretation of results. That means the theoretical framework is the backbone of, of your study. It's like in your body, you have your skeletal system as uh, the pillar so that you can you can stand so the theoretical framework is like that skeletal system for your study to stand for your study to uh, be interpreted and be analyzed then you should be able to have a theoretical framework that would serve as support to your conclusion through your uh, interpretation and for your data analysis of, of the results or put differently the theoretical framework is a structure that summarizes the concepts and the theories which you developed from previously tested and published knowledge which you synthesize to help you have a theoretical background or basis for your data analysis and interpretation of the meaning contained in your research data the theoretical framework is a synthesis of the thoughts of giants or the pillars themselves the proponents the theorists in the specific field of research as they relate to our proposed research or thesis and as we understand those theories on how you or how we 
and use those theories to understand our data. So, in essence, the theoretical framework comprises what leaders in our field of research have to say about a research question, about the problem we plan to investigate and might even include suggest suggestions of how to solve that problem, including how to interpret the findings in the data. What those leaders say or those theorists say can help us develop an informed and specialized lens through which we can examine our data, conduct the data analysis, interpret the findings, discuss them, and even might break from the recommendations and conclusions. So the data analysis and interpretation in an, H, in an HDR or in a HRV is an academic piece of writing and cannot be written as a conversational dialogue. And so type situating, situ, situating our research findings within our theoretical framework can help us to provide that rigor and skills in our study. So that's how important the theoretical framework is. It is our skeletal system in the body. That's why we can stand. So and similarly, um, our research study can be able to stand if we have a strong theoretical framework. But uh, depending on the study, if there's one theory that can already support your own study, then you don't need to have a combination of theory because um, there, there are disadvantages in having a combination of theories but um, one theory if it can already support the independent and dependent variable then that theory would already do and like if um, having so many theories is difficult to test and like if it's only one theory then of course you don't have difficulty in terms of testing it so these are examples of the theories that I will discuss later that you can use for as your theoretical framework. But there are also existing theories that you can use. So as an uh, the first one, which we have the saturated learning or cognition. So theoretically. The materials we create or use, such as cases, basically situate the trainee in his or her operational context. This material is the starting point of the methodology and is followed by the identification of issues and problems while the trainee is to a certain extent familiar with and involved in a specific context. According to Anderson, saturated learning is based on situations in which trainees are involved on a regular basis. The situational skills that trainees receive are supposed to be used in similar situations. Training activities are shared and are, to some extent, actively created in cooperation with other trainees working together to identify and resolve the issues. So, for example, if I'm going to use this situation, situated learning or cognition as part of my theoretical framework in a research project, let's say uh, I will have a modular approach in some areas in Southern Ghana because some a lot of the students the three to four year old children do not have access to the internet so the tendency is i would be able to do one environmental scanning survey for us to know about the environment or it seems like uh, now there will be a needs assessment so as to assess what their needs are in that particular setting uh, in that particular situation and what can help them learn better so this situation, situated learning or cognition can be applied for my module. So by doing the environmental scanning and after gathering the data, then I can be able to improve or analyze or examine what I needed to what I needed to incorporate in the competencies of my modules as part of my extension project. Next is the constructivism. So. Constructivism or a constructivist learning perspectives imply that knowledge and skills can be improved in different ways without necessarily in any one ideal solution. Constructivism is well suited 
Judah situated and sinistic methods as it stresses comprehensible real world functions in organizational environments. In skills molding in a specific envi environment, the values aspect of performance need to be defined, demonstrated, and comprehended. This will enable people and groups to pin pinpoint gaps and deficiencies in performance in a specific skill area. This type of dynamic social participation should also accelerate the learning process. So in other words, the, com the organization can be able to use constructivism as part of the theory of a project because constructivism allows the employee or the trainee to experience or have an authentic form of learning experience. For example, for, for the individual to know or to know how to create a, a logical a proposal based anchored on a logical framework, then of course the the tr researcher himself or herself should be able to experience already how to do a logical framework analysis of a research project. So that means having or acquiring knowledge through authentic learning experiences next the transformative learning theory so the transformative learning theory enables and, and tr encourages trainees to participate actively in shaping the content and and application of learning activities and many will accept possibility of being empowered and actively involved in decision making so the key term here for transformation learning to happen is to be to be empowered and part of the decision making process personal job satisfaction and commitment are also crucial aspects of this type of empowered learning Marginally analyzing employee creativity and discovering the possibility of making decisions and risks that can affect motivation and productivity in a positive way. The transformative and experiential learning is considered with using discretion, delegation, and participation in the decision-making processes. So that means for an employee to be empowered, one should be able to take part or partake in the, in the empowering activities and the decision making process to, to of the of the organization next is the action theory as described by michael fries action theory attempts to explain how learning is regulated and how people can change their behavior to dynamically meet objectives in normal and all unusual situations contrary to many Cognitive and information processing theories, the action theory is linked to behavior. So that's why it's called the action theory, because it is linked to behavior and the employee, the employee and the trainee needs to perform. And specific working context and outcomes. It's also concerned with the processes involved in the interaction between environmental inputs and behavior in the one hand and how cognition regulates behavior and performance on the other hand. So, uh, Swells Boray believed that action theory can serve as a systematic tool for understanding how knowledge of the cognitive processes in a performance situation can be regulated by using focus, sequence, action, and structure components and the foundations of the theory which can interact dynamically. The action structure is the most uh, important component in relation to the synistic processes. The synistic processes would refer to those um, or the approaches of the organization like case study and narratives. So through sensitivity to the complexity of the learning process, the instructors, the leaders, and the trainers can manage learner expectations to reduce information overload and after trainers feel more comfortable with the synistic model or the approaches, then the tendency is they often try to apply it into other club problems in the workplace. For in research, there is the 
action research cycle is also a process where the teachers conduct the action research based on the context of the problems in the classrooms or in, in their own schools. So similarly, the action theory can also involve the performance in a particular situation, considering the focus, the action, and the structure com components to uh, interact dynamically for the trainees to become more comfortable when applying a particular skill. Next is the human capital theory. So, um, human capital theories have developed properly since Menzer, Scott, Becker, and Ben Porath laid their combinations. There are actually diff uh, there are different studies that is using the human capital theory but those studies are actually have actually uh, differing models so as an example of the human capital strategy can include the competency development the learning management the performance evaluation the process involvement the system enhancement organizational integration so that's part of the human capital strategy of, of one study using the human capital theory and there are other studies that also have a different uh, variables for the human capital theory. And since training is regarded as an investment, it involves cost and benefits. So which can be assessed by using the financial criteria, as, uh, such as present value and the internal rate of return. So initially, Becker studied the impact on wage levels of two types of human capital operating in a perfectly competitive labor market that had no imperfections or distortions. One type of human capital can be transferred to other organizations, which encourages employees to cover the cost and to obtain all the benefits of training. However, the second type of human capital is regarded as specific to a company and it cannot be transferred to other companies, which incentivizes employers and employees to share the cost and the benefits of the training. So, uh, human capital theory is based on the neoclassical theories of the labor market, education, yes, we also apply that one in education, and economic growth. It takes for granted that employees are productive resources and attempts to find out whether highly trained staff are more productive than other personnel. So according to Garcia, as employees do not obtain considerable pay increases due to increased productivity after attending specific training sessions, they will not be motivated to finance their own training requirements. However, when organizations um, are keen to cover the training costs, then the tendency is the employees themselves will be more likely to obtain all the returns from the enhance from the enhanced productivity so they can enhance their skills and have new skills generated to help the performance of the organization now in education we can apply we can also apply the human capital theory for example um i would like to study how the english language education can be able to help the curriculum and afterwards can this english language curriculum um help out in the human capital of the Philippines. So I can conduct a survey or a qualitative study on that and determine the, the views of the teachers, the parents, the students themselves who are studying or majoring in English and who believes that English is important. So I can use the human capital theory as part of my framework that the English, English language education can help out in the increase the wage as well as the economic benefits of the um, of the country so that's why there are call center companies that are situated and situated in the Philippines because of such studies as human capital uh, such frameworks theoretical frameworks as the human capital uh, theory so I have here an example of a study uh, which I know that you can read this one in your module. So as an example, the study of Umar, Emmanuel, Emmanuel, and Uloseye. 
So this is an empirical study of trading and development as a tool for organizational performance, the case study of selected banks in Nigeria. So if you notice, the authors only used one theory for their that would serve as their theoretical framework because that the human capital theory as their theoretical framework can already uh, support their results so that's why they don't have other uh, theories apart from human capital theory however it is also probable that you can use um, more than one theory or many theories in your study so long as those can support your objective so it would depend on the problem of your study and um, that's it my last topic will be on the employee learning theories and their organizational applications so this one is the fourth and the last one so I included uh, 10 theories for this topic so this is um this theories here actually sprung from those four uh, some of those four major theories in the first topic but uh the this will only consider the application of those theories in the organization so the first the reinforcement theory of uh skinner so Skinner's principles of behavior modification inform that behavior as determined by its consequences. It has been agreed upon by the management practitioners that applied psychology techniques can be used to resolve numerous issues in the organizations. Skinner underscored the significance of recognizing the desired consequence which will stimulate the desired behavioral response. And since the inception of Skinner's findings, Reinforcement theory has been extensively researched and applied even in the industrial setting apart from the educational setting in order to strengthen the occurrence of unwanted behavior and turn the occurrence of a desired, desirable behavior. So the principles of behavior modification is offering a solution to management issues such as absenteeism, tardiness, and other um, employee issues that have been proven by the studies of applied reinforcement theory that this theory can help in enhancing productivity of the employees. So we have here uh, the, the, the application of the reinforcement theory according to the four themes under the reinforcement theory. So the first one is the positive reinforcement as an example positive behavior followed by positive consequences so this one if the employee has done something good then the employer will praise the employee or give a reward or incentive so for example if you publish the research then of course you will be given a positive reinforcement for you to publish again next time then the punishment uh, the punishment is a negative behavior followed by the negative consequences so as an example if you're late you will be deducted with your salary but if you're absent then similarly so the manager demotes the employee if uh, the employee or the individual has done something negative or have um, exhibit a negative behavior in terms of work and then the negative reinforcement is a positive behavior followed by removal of the negative consequences. For example, if, if the employee has started working earlier and finished on schedule, then the tendency is that the manager will stop nagging the employee. So the negative, the negative um, consequences will be over. For extinction, the negative behavior followed by the removal of the positive consequences so extinction is totally uh, extinct so for example the manager ignores the behavior so um when the applicability of the reinforcement theory in the organization reflects in the studies like that of Cadillac. 2009 so a typical example can be found in the case of snowfly 
Snowfly is a new establishment that schematizes employees and manages workforce incentive programs. So the reinforcement theory, which consists of the four themes like instant recognition, appropriate incentive rewards, accountability, and positive reinforcement was adopted by the company or the Snowfly company to enhance motivation of the work of the workers. However, Punishment, otherwise known as applied reinforcement theory of passive punishment, has been used more than the other types of reinforcement. So, naturally, diminishing unwanted behaviors can be done using punishment rather than offering a reward. And hit this uh, kind of, of uh, rewards and punishment has been used for a long time in the organization, even in the educational setting, in dealing with students. However, constant use of punishment to enhance performance makes it becomes a reward. So we also need to vary that it's not all it's not all about punishment, but more on positive reinforcement. So reward entails the fact that an employee is not punished for not involving in undesired behavior, but the behavior that is being reinforced is diminishing undesired behavior instead of truly making effort to upturn the desirable behavior. Positive reinforcement is connected with enhancing desirable behavior performance in the organization. But the for the reinforcement theory to be applied, it actually varies depending on, on the kind of individual. Uh, for example, um, some of your siblings might be punished through using sleepers. While others will, while other siblings will not really be punished, but rather to discipline them, the parent can apply the heart to heart talk. So similarly, in an organization, the the managers or the leaders can have different strategies in disciplining the their employees. So some would talk by heart to heart, and others can be applied through through um, deduct, salary deduction or, or demotion or it depends upon the consequences of the behavior of a negative behavior. So that's the application of the reinforcement theory for the organization. Next is the nine events of instruction which I have applied a while ago. So considering going back to the nine events, the first level is gaining attention. Now, how can these nine events of instruction be applied? So, the organization can apply the nine levels of Ganya's instruction to ensure that the team or the trainees can fully understand and retain information. So, start the learning experience by gaining the attention of the audience, then, so on and so forth. So when, when the individuals learn something new, they would match the new information with related information or topics that they learned in the past. So let's try to have an example for, for level one until nine. The first one is, le uh, the level one is gaining attention or reception. You can start, the leader can start the learning experience by gaining the attention of the audience. This change in stimulus can allot the group that learning will soon take place. So, for example, in the lesson plan, this is the motivation part of the lesson hook where the activity that we did a while ago is actually gaining attention. That's um, activation activity. So, you can gain attention of, of your employees but, or the trainees by raising the volume of your voice, gesturing, showing a short video on the topic of instruction, while well, using any other event that brings the period of waiting for the lesson to start to an end. Level 2 is to inform the learners about the objective. So you must ensure that your team knows what they need to learn and that they understand why they're about to learn this uh, new information. So you have to explain to your team what they will have learned by the end of the session. Then you also need to explain how well learn learning is going to benefit them and the organization. For example, you might explain that the new process that they're going to learn about will save the organization 20% in overhead fees. So because of recent budget cuts, the new lower cost process will help your organization avoid 
laying six people off in your department. Now that your team understands why they're learning this new information, then the risk are if they don't learn it, they'll be more motivated and more receptive to your and what the risk sorry or what the risk they are they face if they don't learn it, they'll be more motivated and receptive to the training. The level three of Ganya's event of instruction is to stimulate the recall of prior learning or schema or the retrieval. So when the individuals or the employees or the people learn something new, uh, we need to match the new information with related information or topics they've learned in the past. So you can review any previous learning that you've done with your team and apply it to what they already know. So you can also ask your team if they have any previous experience with a topic or if they have experienced the problems that the training is trying to resolve. Uh, then they can make the connections between what they are learning and their previous learning. Level 4 is to present the stimulus or the selective perception. So you have to present the new information to the group in an effective manner. And how can you do that? Well, you have to organize your information in a logical and easy to understand manner. And try to use a variety of different media and styles such as the visual cues, the verbal instruction, and active learning to suit the people with different learning styles. Level 5 is to provide learning guidance or the semantic encoding. To help your team learn and retain the information, you can provide alternative approaches that can illustrate the information that you're trying to comply. So you can help them learn more effectively by including examples such as case studies, graphics, or storytelling or analogies and level six uh, of the of Ganya's cognition condition of learning is to elicit the performance or responding and this stage you have to ensure as the leader or the trainer to, to that your people can demonstrate their knowledge of what you taught, taught them so the way that they show this depends on what they're learning if you've taught a new process or skill, you can ask them to demonstrate how to use that skill through role playing or simulation. If you've taught new information, then you can ask questions so that they can uh, show their knowledge. Level 7 is to provide feedback or reinforcement. After your team demonstrates their knowledge, then you can provide feedback and reinforce any points as necessary. So, uh, since you already taught your team a new technique for handling the difficult customers, then after several role-playing scenarios, you notice that a few team members aren't assertive enough to calm the customer in this fictional tense, uh, very tense situation. So, your feedback and tips, and um, when you point out their mistakes, then you can correct them. So, that is level 7 or the provision of feedback and level eight is to assess their performance so this one is retrieval and your team should be able to complete a test or other measurement tool to show that they've learned the material or skill effectively the team me team uh, members can complete this test independently without any help or coaching from you so you can use tests short questionnaires or even essays can be good ways of of testing your team's knowledge and lastly is the enhancing retention and transfer generalization so in this last stage your team members show that they've retained information by transferring new knowledge or skill to situations that are different from the ones they have been trained to so how are you going to apply it, it uh, you need to have repetitive practice that means repetition which is the best way to ensure that people, that the people or the employees can retain the information and use it effectively. So you have to make sure that your team has enough opportunity to use their learning on a regular basis. You can schedule uh, practice sessions so that uh, they can train on the new process or have a follow-up session to review information or skills. And as they become more proficient, then you can schedule practice runs again and expose them to different situations so that 
so I become more comfortable in the generalization of, of, a, of a particular skill. So next is the social learning theory. So rewards, according to social learning theory, cannot be the exclusive drive that enhances employees' motivation. The motivation can also be enhanced by some other elements such as feelings, beliefs, ethics, and feedback. The learning occurs to three ways in their experience, overall persuasion, and physiological situations. Modeling or a scenario in which individuals see someone's behaviors, embrace and implement them as is, support the learning process as well as uh, psychological situations and the perceptive process. So we have here the four process of under the social learning theory, right? First is uh, you have to get the attention of your um, of your employees prior to the training and then second one is you should be able to uh, conduct let them uh, develop retention so that means to remember the the skills that you taught them and then the motor production that they shouldn't they can be able to perform according to what you taught them and then the motivation is for them to wanting to demonstrate or transfer the skills that they've learned from mod from modeling and observational uh, observational learning. So it's the same it's the same cycle under the social learning theory. Next is the goal setting theory. So a goal denotes the purpose of an act or task in which an individual determinedly wishes to accomplish. The goal setting involves a deliberate activity of instituting stages of performance in order to obtain anticipated consequences. According to the goal setting theory, motivation is sourced from the aspiration and plan to accomplish a goal. Normally, a person or a, t or a team that perceive that his or their present performance falls short of accomplishing the set goal would be stimulated to or either improve his or their efforts or alter his or their strategy. So, uh, some of the considerations for the goal setting setting theory would be to align reward systems with results, to include the employees in your setting of the goals, tie the goals to the work unit, and then set specific goals to achieve. Of course, ask the supervisors to get their goals. Continuously hold the performance meetings from time to time to monitor and, of course, to give an ongoing feedback and coaching. And lastly, to ensure focus on the relevant areas that the organization would need to keep. So, in goal setting, you have to consider the goal setting conditions. A successful goal can stimulate motivation and uh, to meet certain stipulations, such as goal commitment, goal specificity, goal difficulty, and fe feedback toward progress of the goal. The goal commitment is the acceptance of a goal. To determine whether an individual can be motivated to carry out the goal or not. So make sure that the goal is motivating enough and the level of the willpower of the employee in accomplishing the accepted goals can be considered as goal commitment. So the importance attached to the accepted goal and the self-efficacy of the employee is crucial to goal commitment. The goal specificity means that the goal should be specific and measurable has features of a typical goal which can uh, part which is which are part of the anticip anticipations of the goal and a goal of high specificity overtly impacts the performance and consequently gives rise to the higher job performance by the worker as against elusive or goals that are non-concrete or unclear or too broad then the goal difficult, difficulty, so in view of the difficulty, it can be asserted that goals are an effective way of motivation. So integrity should also be taken to cognizance while set, setting high performance goals. 
putting up too much high goals however can be detrimental to motivation and commitment so there should be a room for for and there should be no room rather for a culture of corruption and truthfulness and cutting coldness so make the goal achievable achievable and measurable for for the employees and false feedback is part of, a, of the goal setting theory. So the goal success is determined by the feedback given as it also sustains goal commitment. Um, everybody needs to receive feedback to keep abreast of the progress or otherwise uh, as regards the set goal. And this will make them be able to consider exertion for a successful accomplishment of the goal moreover the feedback can allow for for areas of improvement to turn the weaknesses into strengths and to help the individuals give room for amendment that can be made um, putting the feedback together can indicate that the level of performance of a person and what such person can do differently in order to have better performance. So goal setting is commonly utilized in the organizations as a way to enhance and keep up the performance of the task. Next, Maslow's hierarchy of needs theory. So this one is actually uh, common. Needs theories comprised of hierarchy needs theory was proposed by Abraham Maslow and also Alderfer, although they have different names for their theory, and then Moray. So the perception that individual's motivation originates from his yearning to accomplish a need constitutes what are known as needs theories. These theories portend that unsatisfied needs can encourage and drive individual, as in some situations, satisfaction of needs should be hierarchical whereby some lower needs come first and followed by the higher needs in terms of fulfillment. Defining the motivation as it can be generally stated that motivation refers to the aspiration to accomplish a goal pulled with a vigor, willpower and chance to accomplish it. So Maslow said that the lower needs should be met first and then continue on self-transcendence as the last one. So first, meet the employee's physiological needs for food, for water, for shelter, and then their safety needs for finances and freedom, and then social belongingness, the need for relationships. So a positive uh, work environment would be better for them to um, uh, ha uh, have efficient workplaces. And then esteem needs or the need for respect from their co-workmates, I mean from their co-employees and workmates, and then the cognitive needs, the pursuit of knowledge and understanding, the aesthetic needs is the pursuit of beauty and creativity, and self, uh, self-actualization is achieving individual potential, while self-transcendence is to help others and spiritual experiences. So... The self actualization, uh, the the transcendence needs is the highest in the in this pyramid, and this refers to the need to assert to assist others, and actually um, doing extension service falls in the self transcendence because you're not actually paid to do extension service because you mainly extend or voluntarily help out to in the organization to help others so Maslow's theory is a useful tool to instill the motivation to workers to consequently influence the behavior of the employees the employees behavior are shaped and affected by both external and internal factors so uh, the internal factors would be the motivation and managers would need to consider the lower level needs also in giving preference above higher level needs because this will enhance organizational attractiveness in meeting those needs. Meeting the physiological needs involves a reasonable competitive wage, lunch, coffee breaks, fitness facilities, the creation of com company cafeterias if it's possible, 
for that employees can feel comfortable that his or her basic needs are satisfied in an organization, then the employee would continue to be in that organization for a long time. In addition, the work, good working condition and safe working environment can also be, be part of to fulfill the motivation, motivational needs of an employee to work in an, in a, in an organization. Next, the ERG theory of motivation. So ERG, E stands for existence, R for relatedness, and G for growth. So, um, Adepa profounded this ERG theory of motivation, and it gives room for flexibility. So the levels of need were integrated and diminished into three, what gives consideration to the individual differences. And uh, according to Hunter, Rushenberg, and Schmidt, dynamism is great strength for ARG theory because it acknowledges individual differences and the fact self that can impact individual needs from time to time. Thus, the theory can offer solutions to analyze the dynamics of the human needs that usually transpire in the organization and the theory also stresses flexibility in this area so unlike maslow's theory erg theory posits that concurrent satisfaction if employees multiple needs encourages and stimulates employee and consequently enhance the performances also it portends that it is not necessary to meet the needs in a given order because maslow said that it should be an order but for for um Adolfa, not necessarily in order, because there could be movement back and forth from one need to another, depending if if it is already satisfied. Next, so so the growth needs would refer to the internal system and self actualization. This is the highest part part of the Maslow theory. The related Nest needs would refer to the social interactions and relationships. The existence needs, the lower portion of the pyramid, it would refer to the physiological and the safety needs. So, an organization would need to meet these needs in order for the employee to thrive in that organization. Next is McLean's need theory of motivation. McLean has actually have a realistic, interesting, uh, has an interesting but realistic uh, theory of motivation. This need theory was propounded by McLean because it recognized three needs as stimulating and encouraging elements. The theory recognizes that every individual has a divergent degree of needs. And this is connected to positive organizational behaviors and performance so for example the first one is the need for achievement uh, achievement motivation allows to manifest the need that concerns individuals issues of excellence competition challenging goals persistence and overcoming difficulty so the performance feedback is attracted to the individual that possesses a high need for achievement so, in order for the employee to be motivated to work in an organization, then there's this sense of fulfillment or the need for achievement or recognition. The next is the authority or the power motivation. And people love to have authority and power to exert influence on other people. So, this kind of of people would prefer having control, motivational pursuit status, and prestige, and usually they are the ones who are leaders in the organizations because they need everybody wants to have power in an organization, and at times it can be political, but the eye clashes among co work might. And then next is the need for affiliation. So an individual takes into account uh, being part of a group in order to satisfy its needs. So, uh, it's like peer pressure and a good environment, a good environment should have a good working relationship among the employees. 
Next is the expectancy theory. So expectancy, expectancy theory is also known as process theory. It explicates the, the reason for giving preference for one behavior over another. So this theory was propounded by Vector Broom. And Redmond 2010 observed that a person that expects desired consequence would be stimulated and forbid should take a decision that will give rise to that outcome. So an employee that has belief in his sets of goals would be galvanized and stimulated to achieve such goals since he believes those goals can lead to desired outcome which will enhance him and do him good a reward. The aspiration to fulfill a need is capable enough to make the work valuable. Considering the connection between effort and performance, managers therefore should assign a task that is quite challenging to avoid dullness, frustration, and minimal performance on the part of the workers. So if, as you can see in the formula, um, managers should be aware of the abundant skills and abilities of the workers while it is equally necessary as well to assign the task based on the capability and the competencies that an individual employee possesses. So this is because an employee who perceives he cannot accomplish the task assigned to him would, would be demotivated. So it should be perceived by the managers that employees differ in terms of their self-esteem in accomplishing a particular task that uh, was assigned to them. And the confidence of the employee is pertinent to be able to come up with a good performance that will bring about uh, outcome and reward. So these are the considerations in the expect in the expectancy theory. So what work outcomes will be perceived as a result of the performance? That's the instrumentality. How highly do I value the work outcomes? referred to as the balance so if those of this will be achieved then for the expectancy can i be able to achieve the desired level of task performance as my boss or my manager has given me so it's like setting expectations that the employee can be able to perform accordingly as set by the manager or the team leader Um, expectancy, expectancy theory can be used to influence employee behavior and employee would be motivated to involve in HRD activities if he expects that it will benefit him by enhancing his performance so employee will feel encouraged to attend training if he expects that it will enhance his knowledge and if he knows that the outcome of his effort will be rewarded I guess all employees would really want rewards. So that's that's the expectation. Next, adult learning theory. So adult learning was pro proposed by Leb and uh, he opined, I sorry, this one is Knowles. Adult learning theory is from Knowles. He opined that, however, Leb opined that perceiving the best method through which the adult can learn best forms the basis for being a successful coach. So, adult learning theory, or other, or or otherwise named as andragogy, is a theory that came up with an array of assumptions that, in respect of the methods through which the adults pass through learning. So. Adult learning approach stresses the importance of the learning process. The theory proposes that learning should not be instructive, instructive but rather it should be problem-based and two-way, and that the teacher-learner relationship should be egalitarian. So Knowles, the American expert and the theories of adult education, recognize that adult, the six principles of adult learning would include that adults, that adults would... Uh, have the feature of being internally inspired and enthused and self-directed, that adults should have the feature of integrating life experiences and knowledge with learning experience, that they can focus on the goal they set, they can focus on the germaneness of the learning, and they are practical, and they are fond of being regarded. So that means being considered. That's why at times uh, they really need to be not neglected. So... 
here are some of the thoughts as shown in this um, organizer, the thoughts of no's that involve adult learners, adult learners' experience, uh, relevance and impact to the learners' lives, and should be problem-centered. So adults are internally motivated and self-directed. In a situation whereby information, ideas, or actions are felt to be imposed on the adults who are learners, then such adults would defy such learning. So that's why the HRD executives should ensure that training can be given to senior employees for them to be self-directed and responsible for their learning. Also, the HRD should ensure to promote the learner's internal motivation to acquire the knowledge or skills because the senior employees should be given a chance to apply their standing knowledge and experience acquired from their life experiences to their new learning experiences and they can uh, this can be achieved through serving their interests and past experiences be it personal experience of others and then help in integrating those experiences in the new learning so if you're dealing with with adults uh training adults this theory can actually be applied as part of your theoretical framework and uh, Fishlon and Knowles observed that established a need to learn for the purpose of offering solution to a particular problem in the organization can stimulate the senior employees in the form of organi organization to learn because they are goal-oriented. Thus, it would be imperative to establish the link and the relevance of what is being learned by the senior employee to what they are to accomplish. So, uh, this would boost their commitment to the learning and um next lastly is the information processing theory so although no one among the theorists had made a claim of developing the this uh, information processing theory but it, it was uh researchers shown that a unanimous model was published by atkinson and Schifrin in 1968 so the information processing theory is actually an approach that is useful in the research aspects like cognitive development, neuroscience, social learning, and other artificial intelligence. So, this theory proposes that information can serve as an input from the environment and it passes through the different mental processes using the sensory organs. And then this mental and sensory processes would involve many paths based on the responsiveness, encoding, recognition, and the storage. So for example, in the, in the sensory memory, it can take um, it can take like six seconds and then the information will disappear. In the working memory, probably you can store it in your memory for uh, 30, probably 15 minutes. And then the long-term memory, of course, it's a lot longer. So the volume of information to be processed by the cognitive systems is determined by the central executive feature, which are more primitive sensory areas of the brain. So this central executive feature will firstly need to receive the information from the environment and then process it. Afterwards, it can control which of the environmental contribution will it process. Then the theory observes real-time reactions to obtainable inducements and the way human mind processes and transmutes the information it receives from the environment. So the theory can designate the successful and unsuccessful business strategies. The organizational constituents are said to be receiving the input from the market and the constituents of the organization thereby will then process the information from the market. So in the process, the gatekeepers will scrutinize the information to select the most appropriate one from the information uh, for the organization that they will be integrated into the current culture of the organization. So this information can also be used to determine and design the program for the employee development and employee learning. So that's it. And finally, we're done. So... Here's the application activity I made, finding your purpose. The direction is to uh, examine your current site of personal and professional endeavors and select which among the above mentioned theories. 
particularly the motivation theories have you anchored your professional or personal endeavor so example all of those that you've written here can be supported by the theory of McLellan, the need for power achievement and uh, affiliation so afterwards on the pink one the purpose explain why such theories can support in finding your purpose for example what the world needs so what the world needs right now is a vaccine so what kind of vacation can you have are you a scientist can you be paid for being a scientist so that's an example that you can write here and these are my preferences thank you